privilege to deliver the 2021-22 Scanlon Lecture. I'm extremely grateful to Joy Bray and Sally Hardy and the appointments panel for awarding me this dis distinction. I want to thank Mick McEwen for his nomination, uh, Rushwell Ashmore for his introduction, uh, which has quite moved me. Uh, congratulations to the Castle Hospital for winning uh, the bid to, to host this year's um, uh, Scanlon Lecture and uh, Lifetime Achievement Award. When it was determined that the Castle uh, and Hospital in West London NHS Trust would host this lecture, it seemed opportune for my nomination because I've got a long-standing relationship with the Castle, uh, its staff. Bob Hinchelwood, the clinical director, was my PhD supervisor. And for several years, I was the external examiner here for the MA in Psychosocial Nursing. Now, I have a special affiliation with the idea of therapeutic communities, and this connection will form the thread for my lecture this evening, setting out a historical backcloth the particular contribution of Hildegard Peplau and Annie Outshaw drawing together the psychodynamic essentials of Scanlon's thinking and how these ideas might form an arc of the new era of psychosocial mental health nursing. And I think, uh, fortunately, Russell's uh, suggestion about what I should be talking about, I think I am going to be talking about. So my lecture pays a special attention to the challenge of acuity, inpatient and other secure settings. Um, mm, there are two reasons for this. First, acute uh, secure practice uh, has been one of the mainstays of my work, more late, latterly as a consultant in a prison. Uh, and secondly, inpatient services are sadly neglected when it comes to um, research and practice innovation. Um, influencing the work of inpatient mental health nurses was Jeff Brennan's Skellen Lecture in 2018, uh, something he referred to as the dark arts. It should be stated that Skellen started her career uh, at the castle, and she roomed with Isabel Menzies Lith um, um, during her time here. Um, Lem Bowers, when the Morsley hosted the Skellen Lecture in 2014, said uh, uh, Eileen Skellen was coming home. Um, but actually, as Stephanie says, uh, the castle may lay claim to actually this being her professional birthplace. Uh, which is important. Arguments aside, what we might agree is that uh, Iron in Skellen belongs to all of us, and I want to explain how this might be. Skellen's work uh, and her vision for mental health nursing was not crafted uh, in isolation, and Hildegard Peplau's influence illuminates mental health nursing in the 21st century, uh, 20th century like nobody else. Um, Peplau trained and worked at Chestnut Lodge in the US in the 1930s under the guidance of psychoanalyst psychiatrist uh, Harry Stack Sullivan. Chestnut Lodge is seen as a forerunner to the idea of therapeutic communities where shared administration, patient committees, etc., were situated alongside individual and group uh, therapies. I was fortunate to have some lengthy correspondence with uh, Peplau um, at, um, later in her life, uh, where she shared some in-depth reflections on her time at Chestnut Lodge, in particular her supervision with Frieda from Reichman. Um, I think I caught Peplau uh, towards the end of her life in her 90s in a reflective and candid frame of mind that comes with great age and wisdom. Uh, her closest follower, uh, the late and great Susie Lego, who I'd met on several occasions. Actually, I just remembered Susie came to um, the christening of my son, Logie. My two uh, children are here, but uh, their elder brother, Logie, we had a christening on the banks of um, uh, the River Dee in a very... Uh, obscure part of Scotland and Susie and her husband uh, managed to get along. I was ever so uh, pleased to see them. So Susie introduced me to Peplau and I think that was why Hildegard took me into a confidence. I'll be soon placing uh, the letters in uh, our therapeutic community archive in Oxford. It's noteworthy actually that Peplau was stationed at um, the, the 312th military hospital in Staffordshire um, during the war, a hospital built especially for the rehabilitation of American soldiers. And she mentioned this in one of her letters to me, recalling that the hospital was on the estate of the Earl of Essex. When Peplau arrived at the 312th, the standard treatment was sodium amytal, uh, induced sleep it was called, coma therapy I think, um, and electroconvulsive therapy. Peplau made it known that she thought these ideas and practices to be obscene, quote, and set about transporting ideas from Chestnut Lodge, setting up breakfast clubs, talking sessions, and other activities aimed at stimulating engagement. Her time at the 312th was significant because we later learned that she'd had an affair with an officer, uh, and from this affair her daughter was born. 
Already at this time, Pet Player was concerned with what she called the other 23 hours, the famed psychotic hour uh, of the treatment on the couch, she said, uh, should be uh, carried through to the, the rest of the time on the ward, the other 23 hours. The idea was uh, the analytic encounter could be done on the hoof. Uh, and these ideas Pet Plow finessed and finally set out in a landmark book, uh, Interpersonal Relations in Nursing. In looking at Pet Plow's ideas recently, again, I was struck by the, the, uh, the beautiful um, simplicity uh, of the way in which she sets out her ideas. Unfortunately, you probably can't see these in detail at the back, but um, um, the, uh, hopefully, I don't know if the lecture's been recorded, but you, I, I'm happy to circulate the overheads to anybody that wants to look in more detail. Uh, this graphic, for instance, where she lays out a visualisation of the interaction patterns tallied to the recovery phases in the nurse-patient relationship, orientation, identification, exploitation and resolution, and the role of maternal surrogacy. Um, it's a conceptual framework rather than a model, as Hildegard explained in a conversation with Joy Bray at a conference at the Ulster University in the early 1980s. For those of you who are familiar um, with transaction analysis, um, which actually I find very helpful as an as a, as a introduction to thinking about uh, psychoanalysis and psychodynamic ways of working. Um, Eric Burns' ideas, published in 1961, nine years after Pet Plow, um, there's an uncanny resemblance between Pet Plow's relational graphic and Burns. Uh, I've not been able to find any mention in Burns' writing referencing Pet Plow. Now, you might think this is a happy coincidence, sort of good ideas looking for thinkers, or a failure on Burns' part to point to his sources. The journey through these relational phases, as Pet Plow notes, a fraught uh, mutuality, I quote, reciprocal relations, complementarity versus antagonism, domination, submission. Peplau draws attention to the tough challenge, especially when working with severely ill patients, where there are considerable physical and moral imperatives, she says. Quote, the inescapable fact, the necessary mother surrogate activities, the bathing, feeding, dressing, um, toileting, warning, discipline uh, and approving. And all of the time, Peplau is encouraging us to think about alertness to the transference. That, I quote, the nurse must observe and draw inferences about the role she's taking and the role in which the patient is casting her. The patient may cast the nurse in the role of chum, friend, parent, protagonist, sex object and the like. And thereafter, Peplau tells us uh, to look out for opportunities to find different modes of engagement. Uh, that is, how can old patterns of interaction be, be replaced with a new synthesis of relating? Just looking back at Pet Plough's roots, uh, especially her time at the 312th, for those familiar with TC history, you will have noted that the work of Pet Plough was doing uh, at, at Northfield uh, in the 312th was uh, coextensive with the work that was happening at uh, Northfield. Uh, and Mill Hill. And this is important to the castle uh, because these ideas from Northfield, Tom Main uh, brought back uh, into mainstream psychiatry. The other person I want to talk about is Annie Outshaw um, because the work that was happening at Northfield at the same time uh, with Mill Hill, which was the, uh, where the staff and patients were evacuated from the Maudsley during the war. Um, and it's here that Annie Outshaw's influence is important. Uh, Phil Barker described Annie Outshaw and, um, as one, uh, and Hildegard Peplau as the grand arms of uh, mental health nursing. Here's a, myself and Phil pictured with uh, Annie. As a young psychology student, she'd studied with Alfred Adler and had found an agreeable grounding in Adler's version of the psychoanalysis, which was much more politically uh, and socially constructed than Freud's. Uh, and when Outshaw came to work with um, Maxwell Jones at Mill Hill, she found there was comp compatibility between Adlerian analytic psychology and the development of peer support based approaches at Mill Hill, group therapy, shared administration and so on. And after the, after the war, uh, Outshall continued to work with Jones both at Belmont Hospital, which became known as the Henderson, and later at Dingleton in Scotland. Annie was uh, keenly allied to evolving a, a democratic approach at the Henderson, and given her Adlerian psychoanalytic Marxist background, it is likely that the influence was at the root of the emergence of the principles of social psychiatry with its blend of depth psychology and social democracy. 
the evolution of social psychiatry is so often attributed to Maxwell Jones, uh, but this isn't the whole story. Uh, the, uh, in my PhD research, I interviewed various people, uh, and one of them was Stuart Whiteley, who was the, then the director of uh, the Henderson he'd taken over from Maxwell Jones. Um, and I quote, Maxwell Jones was rather more autocratic than most people think, and actually democracy at the Henderson emerged in spite of Jones rather than because of him, end of quote. And from what I know of Outshaw, she was feisty, and one can well imagine her leading the stand against Jones's autocracy. Uh, these communitarian principles uh, were essential underpinnings, and later uh, Annie carried it into her teaching, and finally when she returned to the Maudsley, uh, influencing uh, generations of nursing students. Jones acknowledged the work of Outshaw, holding her in high regard as the TC movement took shape, becoming the bedrock of the heyday of the first wave of social psychiatry, where her work would overlap with Eileen Skellen. And uh, just recently, the RCN has uh, got a new repository of uh, uh, PhD theses, which was colleagues uh, like uh, Russell and Mick and others voted, uh, and Annie won the vote. So uh, that's a rather nice accolade for her. So turning now to uh, Eileen Skellen. Uh, her journey began at the castle in 1950, where she gained a certificate for nervous disorders and she was appointed as a ward sister. Uh, under the leadership of Tom Main at the castle, uh, at this time it was developing an understanding of multi multidisciplinary milieu and how this could work through the lens of psychoanalysis. Um, this was captured perhaps best known in Tom Main's paper, The Ailment, uh, and Elizabeth Barnes's edited book, Iterating the Approach, which became known as Psychosocial Nursing. When Skellen left the castle in 1952, uh, she followed in Annie Outshall's footsteps, going to work with Maxwell Jones, a sister in charge of a 100-bedded ward at Belmont Hospital in Surrey. Skellen and Jones uh, published a number of papers um, uh, around this time in nursing journals, setting out uh, uh, groundbreaking reflections on group-based approaches and new principles of social rehabilitation. Skellen also published a paper with um, uh, Robert Rappaport in 1957, uh, which is often overlooked in the nursing and TC literature. Um, and this was an uh, at this time, Rappaport was uh, undertaking his ethnographic study of Belmont, which would be later published as Community's Doctor. In this 1957 paper, Skellen and Rappaport set out some novel concepts describing the way in which the hospital was working. The point to the, the usual, they point to the usual hierarchical relations between staff and patients, which were replaced by new terms of engagement with the staff not wearing uniforms, being addressed by first names, and shared spaces for decision making. Uh, taken together, they refer to this flattened hierarchy as democratisation. They then provide fine-grained descriptions of everyday interactions, for example, in the shared space for eating and leisure, and these activities are couched as communalism. They also described the way in which the living learning opportunities for the patients on the ward could lead to frustrations and conflict. Um, and they described this as reality confrontation. And finally, they argue in the paper that there are behaviours which might ordinarily lead to punishment. Um, but they say, uh, such as violence and smashing windows and so on, and they give descriptions of some of these challenging behaviours, but they propose that these behaviours are met with symptomatic thinking and approach therapeutically and for this they argue there needs to be a degree of permissiveness. I mean what, what is notable in this paper and this would be a quiz time I think if you're a TC uh, theoretician but uh, you would recognise here that these are the four cornerstones um, of um, uh, therapeutic community practice that are often just described as Rappaport's four cornerstones, reality confrontation, democratisation, permissiveness and communalism. Uh, these are sort of sacramental to TC colleagues in many places. In one of the TC wings at HMP Dovegate, the words adorn the four walls of the large group community room. These concepts are elaborated later in Rappaport's community's doctor and thereafter attributed to him. But given the fact that they're first set out in this joint paper, I say we ought to refer to these concepts as the providence of Rappaport and Skellen, a conceptual union of nurse and social scientists. It's not to understate the importance of Rappaport's community's doctor, which in describing humanitarian practices offered a crucial anecdote to Goffman's critical anti-psychiatry book, Asylums. Uh, 
But importantly, we should first and foremost remember that it was Skellen, her nursing colleagues, and importantly the patients, who were driving and delivering and living this new radical innovation. And so by implication, accords Skellen as the first author of the TC core principles birthed at the Henderson. Maxwell Jones did diligently pay uh, due regard to Skellen and uh, her colleagues. Uh, his book, Social Psychiatry, which was landmark, said uh, to, dedicated to Eileen Skellen and the work of the nursing team. After she left the Henderson, Skellen uh, visited um, the United States. How familiar Eileen was with Hildegard Peplau, uh, we can't say. Um, but Maxwell Jones did know Peplau. Uh, and in Peplau's correspondence, she told me uh, in the 60s that... Um, Maxwell Jones was doing a lecture tour and he uh, uh, wrote to her to organise a meeting. Um, Peplau did not agree to the meeting um, for reasons that are a little delicate and I don't have time to go into. Um, but from this we might well assume that at least uh, Jones was somewhat familiar with Peplau and perhaps um, Eileen was through that. When Eileen became chief nurse at the Bethlehem and the Morsley Hospitals, in 1963, among many innovations, she set up the Childhood Therapeutic Community, um, uh, the first dedicated TC at the Maudsley, offering a day programme of dynamic psychotherapy where the nursing staff carried individual caseloads. Uh, this was an innovation uh, which influenced the development of other nurses who were keen to develop their dynamic psychotherapy skills. Uh, Bob Hobson, the leader of the Childhood Unit, uh, in his uh, chapter organised, uh, uh, stated, acknowledged Gellin's sage-like influence, quote. It should be said, however, that the uh, TC ideas were percolating throughout the joint hospitals uh, at this time, and Gunnar Dietrich's uh, uh, seminal paper about nursing and therapeutic communities captured something of this atmosphere of the way of thinking. Um, it was in the mid-1980s, uh, Pam Tibbles, uh, have I got that name right, Joy? It was Pam Tibbles. Pam Tibbles, uh, I remember reading uh, a paper that she said that all of the wards at the Bethlehem and the Morsley were operating as uh, therapeutic communities. Um, and under Skellen's stewardship, nurses like Beatrice Stevens, Harry Wright, Sue Ritter and many others finessed their psychodynamic approach in all aspects of their delivery. There's certainly much more to say about Skellen's legacy, her leadership, national policy, her role in establishing the first International Psychiatric Congress in 1980, from which the Skellen Lecture emerged following Eileen's untimely death just a few months before the conference. And it's hard to summarise her clinical acumen and vision, but we might say that she offered something of a bridge between Peplau with her deep roots in psychoanalysis and Annie Outschall's visions of a social democratic approach. And with this family of ideas in mind, I now want to turn to some uh, questions uh, of her legacy. Uh, the sociologist Nick Manning uh, wrote eloquently about the pitfalls of charismatic leadership in TCs. Uh, and today we accept that a charismatic idea has far greater endurance than a charismatic leader. So it's worth keeping, keeping in mind that Skellen was part of a matrix of ideas uh, which were inductively coalesced in a new paradigm. Considering where Scanlon's vision might be relevant for mental health nursing today, I'm going to set out uh, two pillars. Uh, first, the necessary core psychodynamic principles of psychosocial nursing, and two, the delivery of uh, communitarian-based approaches. I think it's timely uh, to think about these, given the recent review um, by Mary Watkins for NHS uh, England Health Education England, uh, which is titled Commitment and Growth, Advancing Mental Health Nursing Now and for the Future, where her first theme speaks to an agenda of establishing, reclaiming and belonging um, the purpose of contemporary mental health nursing, she says. And her first recommendation is that mental health nurses should be providing evidence-based practice and that nurses need to develop um, interpersonal skills to provide contemporary care for the populations they serve. And this is what Stephanie was drawing our attention to at the beginning. Her second recommendation is that mental health nurses should enhance the therapeutic relationship, valuing experimental knowledge while acknowledging and overcoming the power differentials between staff and service users. You can probably see where this is going. Um, it's when she, Actually, I noticed in the document, um, 
the word experimental is later replaced by experiential. I think it is experiential that Mary's talking about, and this is helpful, I think, to think about the contribution of um, Phil Bernard as a you know that way of learning. And these recommendations speak closely to the practice of psychosocial nursing uh, as a model of interpersonal relations and also the democratic mission of TCs. So in mapping out a set of required interpersonal skills, there are some ready-made theoretical frameworks which we can uh, turn to to nurture mental health nursing knowledge and shape the delivery of interventions. I'm going to... Uh, explain uh, just the four concepts that I think we ought to um, enshrine, core psychodynamic concepts. I recently had a discussion with Catherine Gamble and Martin Hogan uh, in regard to a short CPD programme for the staff in South West London Mental Health Trust with the remit of helping staff to develop their interpersonal skills, drawing on psychodynamic ideas. Um, Catherine Gamble uh, was wanting me to talk to her colleagues about uh, psychodynamic thinking. Catherine Gamble has turned, albeit briefly, to the dark side, we might say. Um, and you might be interested to know uh, our colleague Sarah Doyle, in collaboration with Human Development Scotland, has set up a 10-month programme of online discussions combining a series of lectures with reflective practice and work discussion groups that are going to be facilitated um, by psychodynamic uh, experts. And it's a, it's, if you have a look um, at the the programme, it's a, it's a really good-looking programme of, of contemporary approaches uh, that isn't just about depth, but also worrying about homelessness, substance mis misuse, uh, exclusion and displacement. So this is a sort of very political sort of uh, uh, way of looking at uh, psychodynamic thinking. I'm looking forward to working with Sarah and Celeste Foster in evaluating how the programme develops uh, and how the knowledge, importantly, impacts on the practice of uh, the participants and the clients. Any psychodynamic thinking must begin with the unconscious, the existence of our dreams and all of their madness uh, and peculiarities that give us a glimpse that we're all prone to sleeping states of psychosis. For some people, we know that the mind can continue to play tricks when we are in a state of wakefulness. Uh, the psychoanalyst Wilfred Bion tells us the person who suffers from schizophrenia has lost the capacity to dream. At best, our dreams work for us in clearing out the insane clutter. But for some people, the cellophane between sleeping and waking is torn. And mental health nurses are most commonly the first set of eyes and ears and hand that a severely ill person will encounter. Uh, there to lend a hand and a voice that can be an anchor in the unimaginable storm of psychosis, to borrow an idea from Murray Jackson. An understanding of the unconscious is the royal road, um, if you like, um, to uh, engaging with deep distress. Uh, this is something uh, that Richard Lucas describes, uh, turning in, tuning into the psychotic wavelength. Uh, that is, listening is like tuning into an old analogue radio where you need to find the correct dial setting so that the crackle and intermittent voices begin to cohere, where a voice can be heard and an interpersonal connection can be found. Mental health nurses are in the business of meaning making, and some colleagues uh, have been keeping uh, these ideas afloat, and um, perhaps the best, best known among our number are uh, Anne Ayabusi and Marcus Evans, um, Len Bowers and I and colleagues published a monograph that's also a useful resource at how to talk um, with people acutely distressed. And more recently, Mark Pearson in his PhD research uh, has been doing some important work looking at psychosis and poetry as meaning making for recovery. Uh, Mark's been talking about this idea of poetic um, wavelength. Um, I'm not sure whether it was Mark's idea or whether it was mine, but um, we're hoping to explore it a bit more in a symposium if it's accepted at the Mental Health Nurse Academics Conference um, this year. As well as understanding the unconscious, the concept of transference and counter-transference should be core knowledge asset embedded from the very start of basic training. Uh, and Peplau's overview remains essential here. I'll also add that a working knowledge of projective identification and containment also offer uh, the essential base for nurses and other practitioners working in highly charged milieu. These concepts might ordinarily be seen as rather advanced, but in my experience, these ideas are intuitively understood by nurses and the pedagogical challenge is often uh, little more than bringing a theoretical frame uh, 
uh, to underpin practice. Uh, I recently published a paper about how the idea with uh, Rex Haig and Steve Shaw um, about um, some of these ideas about projective identification uh, with prison officers. And uh, in the paper, we showed how the concepts were effective uh, in terms of uh, de-escalation, reducing levels of violence and self-harm. Psychosocial nursing is and must be politically alert, accounting for the reality of poverty, social deprivation, and the need for social inclusion. And this is the agenda for Mary Watkins' theme too. Unite, engage and overcome, addressing inequalities through diversity and inclusion. And these approaches need to be trauma-informed, understanding the pathways that have led to mental distress, where we pay attention to service users' lived experience, identifying the history of events that have led to self-destructive patterns. I think, um, I think as Mick and Russell were talking about the importance of a historical understanding of our profession, of where we've come from, I think so often mental health practitioners and mental health nursing overlooks the history of our service users. So I think, you know, we understand, we try and learn from the past in order to, this was uh, both Annie Outshaw's and Peplau and Skellen's work, I think, that we find different ways um, through a trauma-informed lens to find new modes of engagement. And contrary to the popular belief for some that the past is a different country, and there's little time to visit it in modern practice, psychodynamic exploration does not take a long time. Most of Freud's anal an analyses were done in no more than six weeks. So by my calculations, that's 30 hours. And that's less than one working week of Peplau's intensive care TC work. It's worth mentioning that psychodynamic approaches are fundamentally concerned with emotional states of mind, such as sadness, loneliness, anxiety, anger, and so on. So the idea of containment in psychodynamic terms refers to the task of emotional containment or holding in mind as much as it is about the physical idea of containment. Um, uh, these are the windows uh, that can illuminate the inner world of, our, of service users, especially where we can begin to find words to replace action. And uh, I won't go into these uh, the Saussurian uh, modification in this idea of words over action. I won't have time, but um, uh, that's something I've been thinking about. So the second area that I want to talk about is group-based and therapeutic community approaches. Um, and this is uh, recommendation two from Mary Watkins. Uh, mental health nurses must enhance the therapeutic relationship, uh, overcoming and acknowledging the power differential between staff and service users. Uh, and it should be stated that the rebalance of power is the raison d'etre of therapeutic communities. Uh, we can see from Skellen's work that she was committed uh, to um, multi-stakeholder engagement, including clinicians like administrators, with an emphasis on engaging and empowering uh, patients. I was just thinking when I was reading this earlier about um, uh, one time, it's not always easy to uh, build these systems of empowerment within a, a large system like the, the hospital or the NHS. I remember I gave the uh, linen cupboard key to uh, the patient's group or, um, so we had different tasks, but we did have somebody that was in charge of linen, and I gave the key um, to, the, to the patient uh, who lost the key, and then we had to get the locks changed, and I got into all sorts of bother. But um, it was a system that eventually did uh, find a, a very helpful place. So this is the idea of co-constructive practice that's been the beating heart of therapeutic communities. Um, and it's fitting this evening that we've celebrated the inaugural Co-Constructive Practice Award, and it's heartening uh, that this award will be tallied to the Skellen Lecture in the future, uh, adding impetus to the service user voice and experience which is brought to the fore. Uh, and I just wanted to mention Sarah Ray's research as well, uh, which is, I think, real cutting-edge uh, research. Um, for Skellen, the importance of groups and group dynamics cannot be understated. Um, alongside the psychosocial space of the ward, in the heyday of social psychiatry, group approaches were seen as essential. Uh, I did a survey with Sue Davison at the Maudsley um, Hospital in the late 1980s, uh, and we found that 40 out of 41 of the wards were running daily groups. Uh, but the attitude to groups changed from the mid-1980s onwards with the rise of biology and more individualised approaches like CBT. 
In fact, there were many who believed that for acutely ill patients, group situations were counterproductive because of their highly emotional uh, uh, expression in the group. And by the turn of the millennium, uh, uh, groups had lost their place, even in progressive wards. There was little by way of evidence that groups were not helpful, but there was little by way of evidence that they were. This is one of the problems of researching what we might think of as complex treatment environments. Sally Hardy and I both felt down in the mouth about the demise of groups, and both of us had come to truly value the worth of getting staff and patients together, and even when the experience of the group was difficult, we saw how a group meeting could clear the air. One fact we observed anecdotally was between us, we didn't ha have any, uh, we noticed how little there were of violent incidents in group situations. Um, and this seemed to be contrary to the opinion of those who talked about the dangers of high expressed emotion. We approached three other senior nursing colleagues who had uh, run and were running inpatient groups to see if their experiences were the same. Um, we simply asked, how many violent incidents have you witnessed in inpatient groups? Uh, and it should be said that um, one of the people that we talked to um, was uh, Beatrice Stevens, um, who had uh, accumulated um, more experiences in groups um, than the, the other four of us put together. Uh, Beatrice, who, for those of you that know, is one of the most senior and respected uh, nurses of my uh, lifetime. Uh, uh, I, I, she mentored me over many years. Um, so we each approximated the number of groups we'd sat in and for how long, and across our time as trainees and over our careers, and then tallied this against the number of violent incidents. You might want to note that in adding up these hours for all of us, we were drawing from experiences where at any one time we'd probably been in a group during our work day between eight and 15 hours working in groups. This is not unusual in therapies at community practice. In the end, I must stress this is a broad approximation uh, we tallied up 40,000 hours to one violent incident. Between us, there was one incident, uh, and that was my fault. Um, I was working as a, a student on the intensive care unit at the Maudsley. Um, a patient in a group got up, walked across the centre of the group and hit me, uh, turned around and went and sat down again. A few weeks later, I asked him why he'd done it, and he said I was staring at him. Um, which, to be fair, I was. Uh, or at least I was trying to maintain good eye contact, which I had been led to believe was essential when someone was suffering from hearing voices or hallucinating. The patient taught me a helpful lesson. I'm not sure if it was Joy Bray who taught me this lesson that you have to have good eye contact, but um, uh, there is something to be said for not always maintaining good eye contact. Of course, psychoanalysis realises that it's OK not to have any eye contact at all. The data was published with a number of qualifications that the sample was not random. All of us had been trained in group therapy and we were passionate about the value of groups. But these uh, caveats should not limit the point here. Compared to other timetable events in the ward community, such as medication time, meal time or visiting times, formal group time is possibly the optimal intervention for patient safety and violent reduction. Scanlon's point, Scanlon points to this idea, points to this idea of engaging with conflict head on, as groups aren't always easy. Those of you that have worked in groups or been in groups, you know that sometimes they're very difficult encounters. But Scanlon says we should meet uh, the conflict head on. We should embrace the inevitability of disruption when things go awry, particularly in regard she says, to the shared use of the kitchen by the community, where conflicts can become overheated. Uh, and these abruptions need not be taken as failures, but rather as opportunities to derive, arrive at a dynamic understanding of how patterns from the past are repeated and recycled. Uh, working with peers and staff can help lead to new relational patterns. Psychoanalysis is a helpful epistemology here, insofar as it begins with the dialectical idea that conflict is at the heart of who we are. Eros and Thanatos life and death. Uh, but contrary to popular belief, uh, psychoanalysis begins with a highly optimistic agenda that we can come and overcome these conflicts. Embracing uh, disruption means you must be confident to have the interpersonal tools and not just medication to manage it. Um, 
In order to make sense of these abruptions, I think, then we work towards the resolution, and the idea of containment is helpful here. However, as Celeste Foster points out, psychoanalytic understanding of uh, the container and container relationship uh, in mental health nursing is not yet widely accepted. Um, of course, there's going to be a place for physical containment, uh, but we need to ensure that we hold in mind the idea of psychological and social uh, emotional elements. And Gwen Adshead's paper on secure attachment, where she's writing about uh, institutions like Broadmoor, neatly draws attention to the fit between Bowlby's idea of secure base and the circumstances of security in a hospital. And so we need to think about the same ends with the concept of containment. The group is a containing space um, that Beyond talks about. And I'm sure Skellen would be urging us to teach all new students about this idea. Student nurses are reared in groups uh, and nurse educators need to harness this. Inpatients live in groups and we need to engender a dynamic awareness of considering the ward community as a group, not just in places like the castle, but in all uh, hospital in community environments where people come together in distress. The ward round is a group event and we should be more creative in how they're conducted. For example, at HMP Dovegate, the clinical reviews, which are the equivalent of ward rounds, involve the inmates or residents bringing in three or four peers who give feedback on their progress, which is added to the clinical opinions of the multidisciplinary team. Coming to my concluding remarks. To summarise, Skellen's vision and that of Peplow and Outshaw uh, should compel us to consider the dynamic situation of the family, group interpersonal relations in all our encounters, not just with service users, but a culture of inquiry where we explore our relations with staff teams too. The ward environment needs and must be developed with a greater sense of home as method, and this should be the catalyst for nurses to consider the interplay of the primary group, the family, and its democratic potential and also uh, sibling relationships. Understanding transference and counter-transference must be as core to mental health nursing as taking the temperature is to general nursing. And to see through Watkins' recommendations for advancing mental health nursing, we should agree that a simple set of core psychodynamic skills should be at the disposal of all mental health nurses. A group dynamic formula uh, should be the keystone in the architecture of all therapeutic environments uh, where people come together. And I'd include also the necessity of a thoughtful built environment. I've had the chance to visit a number of um, new builds around my trust. Uh, and just th these places really aren't set out very well for therapeutic engagement. Um, so I think service users should be at the forefront of environmental design. On one of my visits to Ningbo in China, uh, where my university has a campus, uh, I visited a psychiatric hospital on the outskirts of the city. I was shown around by the medical superintendent, um, met nursing staff, and I played table tennis with patients and absolutely got destroyed. Um, and they were building a large new wing, and I was shown around the development. And when I in inquired about the size of the wards, they said they were designed for 30 patients. I passed a comment that my best experience as a charge nurse had been when I had a ward of 11 beds, um, because this meant that we could run the ward like an extended family. Um, with small daily groups and manageable rotors for cooking and cleaning and so on. And that my experience of larger wards of 30 patients meant that it was more difficult to create the necessary intimacy for rehabilitation. Uh, that evening I went out for dinner with the Ningbo Health Party Chair, uh, a woman whose authority was considerable and probably unquestioned. The translator said that she'd heard about my visit to the new build and she wanted me to know that they'd changed the design of the wards. Instead of a 30-bedded ward, they would now have three wards of 10 beds. I don't think this was just diplomacy. Uh, and actually, if Mick McCune will forgive me, uh, this was an example of how sometimes forms of government other than democracy can yield swift progress. The concept of psychosocial practice, originally outlined by the Castle nurses in the 1960s and carried through to today, has been hijacked by some of our colleagues working in allied fields. Um, for instance, Smith et al.'s paper, uh, the concept of psychosocial seems rather more camouflage for giving medication to people in the community. Uh, we need to, to rescue the concept of psychosocial practice so that it draws much more squarely from the castle tradition and the work of Skellen. Uh, 
an upcoming special edition of the International Journal of Therapeutic Communities, um, edited by uh, Fiona Nolan, uh, with really important papers, including service user authored papers, is uh, going to be very timely. Um, it, it will enlighten our uh, the growing number of um, uh, other colleagues around the world about the work of the Castle. Uh, psychosocial nursing, um, the TC family abroad, as uh, the late Rowdy Yates used to call it, uh, calls it. The psychodynamic tradition uh, maintained a continuity of philosophy that underpins the craft and caring of emotional labour with these uh, four maxims, uh, core maxims, um, which are, I was hoping not to have to read out, but I will read out because uh, they're difficult to read from the back, I think. The existence of the unconscious, the mental distress, commonly subject to unseen psychic forces, which cause abruptions in the lives of people who suffer. The illness is less about biological imbalance and more the result of lived experience. We're developing a language for talking about emotions under the rubric of trauma-informed practice. Uh, um, Three, the necessity of reparative interpersonal relations, which should be the bedrock of psychosocial mental health nurse training, and then advanced in CPD, covering transference, counter-transference, projective identification and containment. And four, the generation of evidence base for practice using qualitative research methods, including uh, scaling the therapeutic relationship. Uh, these core concepts provide the necessary experiential base for ongoing discussions in clinical supervision where nurses develop the capacity of being able to accurately detect emotional states and respond accordingly. There is too much therapeutic potential that we miss today and I put to you colleagues that Skeleton's vision can guide our advance for the benefit of service users. And just to finish off, as um, a quote from uh, Skellen, she says, future research into the psychological ecology of mental hospitals should unearth a rich store of information about how other such life regions can be better understood and used for psychotherapy. There is a trend in mental hospital reform that calls for increased use of therapeutic potentials of the whole hospital environment, providing a milieu that is therapeutic rather than custodial, being tolerant, showing sympathy and providing the human element. These aspirations are still as pressing today as they were then. Thank you.